<laughs> okay, cool. All right, so uh, as Jeremy said, I am Richard Townley. I am the secretary, which means that I uh, take the meeting minutes and then I read them to you guys at the beginning of the meeting. And uh, sometimes I also talk about stuff about space. So uh, today I'm going to talk about taking a picture of an exoplanet. And um, basically what I mean is, uh, well, first of all, I should mention, we actually have already taken pictures of exoplanets before. This is an image of uh, the star Fomalhaut, or at least the stuff around Fomalhaut. Basically, this was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, and uh, Fomalhaut's right in there, but it's basically, it's sort of, they sort of blocked out the star, and uh, they found an exoplanet in orbit around it, along with a bunch of other debris around it. But uh, you can see right there, there's a tiny little dot. That is actually an exoplanet in orbit around the star Fomalhaut. And of course, what an exoplanet is, it's just a planet, instead of orbiting the sun, it orbits some other star off in space. So we've actually taken pictures of exoplanets before, but the problem is they only look like tiny little specks. We can't actually really see them uh, as any sort of real resolution as planets. They just look like points of light. So what I'm talking about is how we can possibly get an actual multi-pixel image of an exoplanet. So how do we actually do that? Well, we have to make use of our sun. And uh, that might sound weird. Why would, how, what would the sun have to do with taking pictures of things far away? Well, there is, uh, there is sort of a way you can use it, and that is through something called gravitational lensing. Now, um, basically, this, this has to do with general relativity, which is extremely complex, and I can no, in no way go over the entire thing here today. But basically, the uh, short version of general relativity is um, anything that has mass, anything with weight, uh, bends the fabric of space-time around it. So this is a picture of two galaxies. Uh, here's one that's sort of in the foreground, and uh, then there's this other one that's behind this galaxy uh, with respect to us on the Earth. And uh, you see it's sort of warped and distorted. It looks all warped and distorted there. That's because the light that's coming from that galaxy has actually been bent by the gravity of this foreground galaxy, and it's sort of bending around it, and uh, it comes out into this shape here, which is called an Einstein ring. And so not only is the light bent, but it's also actually magnified. And it also gets uh, a lot brighter because of uh, the sort of warping of the space around it. It sort of acts as a lens, actually. So basically, uh, things that have mass, and it's not just uh, massive galaxies. Our sun does it. Uh, in fact, the planet Earth does it to a tiny extent. And even I am doing it, although it's so negligible, uh, you won't be able to see the bent light from behind me or anything because I'm so I don't I don't weigh as much as this galaxy. But um, yeah, so basically, massive objects can bend light like this and uh, magnify it like that. So uh, basically, the way this would work to actually get a picture of an exoplanet is uh, here's a diagram that's not to scale. Uh, basically, we have our distant exoplanet we want to take a picture of over here, and then we have the sun, and then somewhere out here, uh, out here we have a space probe that is sort of positioned in such a way that uh, the sun is directly in between this exoplanet and the space probe. Of course, the exoplanet is actually much further away, but you know it's just a diagram. So what happens is, of course, this exoplanet gets lit up by its own star, and then that light makes its way in all directions, some of which would uh, come our way, and uh, they'll sort of bend around the sun, and then they could be captured by the space probe. You'd see sort of an Einstein ring, uh, like I talked about before, but it would be of the light from this exoplanet. And uh, this is sort of, this is again not to scale, but this is sort of what it would show you um, if that exoplanet looked exactly like Earth. Um, here's sort of what it would look like. There'd be the sun in the center, and uh, then you'd see the light from that around the sun sort of like this. Of course, um, it would actually be a lot smaller than this. It'd be probably about even narrower than the point of my laser is how narrow this Einstein ring would be. But uh, this is just to give you an idea, basically, of what's going on here. So it'd be magnified, and it'd be bright enough that um, a spacecraft, if it were in the right position, could actually take a picture of this and uh, sort of see details on the surface of that exoplanet. The problem, though, is that in order to do this, you have to be 550 astronomical units away from the sun, because that's the minimum distance you have to be for the light to actually sort of come into a focus. Um, if you're closer, uh, it'll get bent a bit, but it won't be focused enough. And also, since the sun isn't quite like a normal lens, uh, or at least this gravitational lensing isn't quite like normal lenses we use in telescopes, it's not quite a focal point, it's more of a focal line. So basically, from 550 astronomical units, uh, continuing on to about eight or nine hundred or so, um, there's this basically line where the light from this exoplanet will be focused um, around the sun in the Einstein ring. 
Another problem, though, is that this sort of area is only 1.3 kilometers across. So basically, all the light from the exoplanet would be sort of condensed in this 1.3 kilometer cylinder. Um, and it would, of course, be a very long cylinder, but very narrow as well, because basically, um, depending on where you were in the cylinder, you'd be seeing like different parts of the exoplanet's surface, basically. So uh, that's that. That's the first problem. But uh, basically, some of you might be wondering, couldn't we just use the Event Horizon Telescope to do this? No, no, we couldn't. Um, for, if, for those of you who've been living under a rock for the past three months, um, we recently got this picture, uh, basically using a giant um, network of radio telescopes all across the globe. And they pointed them all at uh, the black hole at the very center of M87, which is a giant galaxy. And uh, basically, they took data at the exact same time and using some sort of magic called very long baseline interferometry. It's actually just complicated science, but uh, whatever. We got this picture, and uh, this is the first actual picture of a black hole. And of course, this was the first time this had ever been attempted. And this is a very, very small object. Well, it's very big, but from our perspective on Earth, it's really tiny. Um, to give you perspective, Perspective, uh, from one side of this image to the other, that's about 40 micro arc seconds across. Probably never thought you'd heard, uh, you'd hear that unit actually used seriously, but no, this is that's actually how small it appears in our sky is 40 micro arc seconds, which is extremely tiny. But uh, the problem is. If we were to actually point this at uh, an exoplanet, how big would that be compared to, say, this image? Well, let's take, for example, um, the star system known as TRAPPIST-1, which is uh, basically that uh, exoplanet system where there are about seven of them. They're all very close to their host star, and some of them actually might be Earth-like. That is 39.6 light years away, and a lot of the planets there are about the size of the Earth. So if we were to use uh, the same sort of uh, very long baseline interferometry to take a picture of the exoplanet, Exoplanet, how big would it be? Well, uh, I actually, you can't see it very well because it's actually right on the top of that, but uh, about the size of my laser pointer is the answer. That's about how big it would be. Uh, because basically, it's not to say those planets are extremely small, it's just to really to say that uh, Pauahi, which is the name that this black hole has now, is really, really big. So even if we were to use this amazing uh, technology we use to capture the black hole, it still would be nowhere near powerful enough to actually do this. But how powerful would it be if we could actually make use of this solar gravitational lens? What would we be able to see then? We might be able to see something like this. So this is a simulation showing sort of an example exoplanet um, imaged using this solar gravitational lens. And you can actually see, um, you would be able to see a lot of details on the planet's surface, assuming it has any details to be seen. Um, in fact, uh, you, the resolution would be on the order of one pixel in this image would be about 10 kilometers on the surface of that exoplanet, which is very, very good. In fact, that's about three times better and then the Hubble Space Telescope can see the planet Mars from, on, from uh, its position orbiting the Earth. So we'd be able to get actually really incredible resolution, considering this is something the size of Earth about 40 light years away from us. It's that tiny. It's about the equivalent of getting a very fine picture of a human hair on the moon from the Earth. That's about how, how amazing this is. So, um, and also, the, the furthest away we could go would be about 100 light years away. So this has really great potential. But there are some problems with it. Uh, we can't just quite go and do it uh, right away. There are some things we have to fix first. First of all, it takes a really long time to get out to 550 astronomical units. Because uh, just to give you perspective, one astronomical unit, what that is, is the distance between Earth and the Sun. And this is 550 times further away than that. So to give you Voyager 1 is 138 astronomical units away. So it's, it's not even, it's a little bit about a fifth of the way there. And that was launched in the 70s. So it takes a long time to get out there. Um, just to give you a perspective, though, with the most optimistic scenario, basically, if we were to take the still in development space launch system and we were to launch this satellite aboard that going extremely quickly, and it could maybe make it to Jupiter in, say, six months at maximum speed, and then if it were to fly by Jupiter and do a gravitational assist, but instead of boosting it further out, um, it would sort of boost it further towards the sun. Um, basically, if it were to fly by the sun very closely, it could basically make maximum use of the orbit effect, which basically that is when you're deep in a gravitational well, um, you sort of get more bang for your buck with your rocket because it makes basically if you were to fire your rocket, you'd be able to go 
end up going a lot faster than you would much further out. So if we were to make maximum use of this and go say about five to seven solar radii in there and then make maximum use of that, we could possibly get out to that distance in about 30 years. So that's still, that's still a long time, but it's still extremely quickly compared to anything else we've ever launched outside the solar system. But 30 years, still a very long time. And also, it's pretty hard to receive a signal from that far away. Um, right now, if you've seen pictures of the Voyager probe, basically the thing is mostly a dish. It's mostly a radio dish, and it has some other instruments stuck on it. But it's mainly a dish because it's going, of course, it's extremely far away. It needs to send and receive signals from Earth. And uh, basically, they powered down most of the instruments on it uh, about 10 years, maybe even more than 10 years ago, actually. Um, and uh, basically, it's just sending minimal data back and forth, and it's still hard to receive that. And that's less than the fifth of the way to uh, this uh, focus focus point. So it'd be pretty hard to receive a signal from that far away. So we'll have to possibly um, either just build a bigger dish or find some other uh, way of solving this problem. Another thing is, it's very difficult to bullseye an area that small, 1.3 kilometers, um, when it's that far away, and also to stay within it. Um, so, you know, we can, we can go to things like uh, Pluto pretty easily because Pluto's kind of a big target. It's hard, um, even though it's very far away, it's still kind of hard to miss and you can take measurements and adjust it on the way there. Can't exactly do that when this is sort of an imaginary area of space that you have to know. You can only know when you get there, when you're actually there, when you turn the cameras back and take a picture of the sun and you see, ah, there's the Einstein ring. So it'd be pretty hard to bullseye it, but I think probably, you know, NASA is pretty good at what they do. They, they probably would be able to do it, but uh, it's still very hard to actually hit that target. We'd only be able to image one exoplanet because basically it has to be uh, directly behind the sun. So say if there's one over in um, the constellation Sagittarius that we wanted to image, you know, we could send it out to that uh, location sort of opposite that uh, relative to the sun, then take a, you know, take a picture of the Einstein ring that way. But if there was another one in, say, Orion that we wanted to image, we'd have to send a different probe to go there because it basically can only go to one of these because once it's on its way, it can't really turn back. It's just sort of on its way out of the solar system and while it's moving away it can take those pictures. So it'd basically be a mission to uh, take a picture of one exoplanet. But I mean we already have probes that are single sort of mission things uh, like New Horizons was basically a single mission. It went to Pluto and we also got to see one other thing on the way. But basically we'd only be able to see one so we'd have to choose our target very carefully. And another problem is, um, since we're taking a picture of basically the sun and also this Einstein ring, well, since the sun is basically a giant exploding ball of gas that's extremely bright, it could interfere with the Einstein ring. It could interfere with this image, because the corona, uh, while it's not as bright as the sun, is still pretty bright, and so there'd be some corona light mixed in with the exoplanet light. So we'd have to find a way to account for that, and also hope that there aren't anything like giant uh, solar flares or prominences or something that get in the way. In fact, a better bet is to actually go out another 100 astronomical units away to 650, because uh, at that point, the sun would appear smaller relative to the Einstein ring, so it'd be less corona to interfere at that point. But of course, that adds extra time onto the mission and extra distance, uh, like like we talked about before. And lastly, the spacecraft would actually have to traverse that entire cylinder uh, focus area in order to be able to image this thing. So basically, uh, this is that image I showed you before of that imaginary 1.3 kilometer wide cylinder of space. It would have to say, go here and take a picture of the Einstein ring, and now give it one tiny piece of the exoplanet's surface, and then go here and here and here and here, and etc. and basically traverse this entire area and still be able to uh, take all of those pictures um, because we're hoping to basically get a grid of about a thousand by a thousand pictures, which is basically one million uh, of these images total, and then sort of combine that together and uh, get that image out of it. But uh, yeah, it's very difficult to do that, especially when you consider that this exoplanet is orbiting its star, so it's not going to stay still while it's doing this. So that means actually this sort of area will move around as that planet orbits its star, so it'll have to sort of stay within this area. Uh, and account for that, as well as account for the planet itself, which is rotating, and account for the proper motion of the sun and the other star that that planet is orbiting, and a bunch of other things. So basically, this is moving around all the time, and uh, you basically have to stay within it and go to precise positions within it to actually get this all out of it. So it's very difficult to do. 
But there are some benefits to this mission as well. Uh, for example, it uses already existing technology. Uh, we already know how to launch probes outside of the solar system. Uh, we already have the camera power to basically point it back at the sun and um, get basically an image that would you'd be able to see the Einstein ring around it, even though it would be this far away. Basically, um, negating all the other problems, we could basically send the Hubble telescope out there, and it would be able to do that with its camera. So it, we already have the technology mostly to do this. And we already know how to basically undistort that Einstein ring, because remember, it's coming in in like a weird warped ring around the sun instead of just a single picture. So we'd have to basically take that and deconvolve it back into the actual image. Fortunately, though, we already know how to do that using computer uh, image processing software. And uh, also, it wouldn't have to only take a picture of this exoplanet. While it's on its way out of the solar system, it could accomplish plenty of other scientific objectives. Like, um, since we're sending something really far out into space. Um, it could also try to measure some of the parallax uh, more accurately for other stars, since it would be 550 AU away instead of 1 AU away from the sun. It could uh, measure that stellar parallax more accurately and tell us the distances to other stars even better than we have um, right now. And many other things like that, like um, just basically things that wouldn't involve uh, interference from being inside the solar system. So it could do... Mm-hmm satellite would orbit the sun. Well, yeah, it would be it would be on its way. Well, yeah. Astronomical units out, the gravitational effects of the sun mm -hmm. are not going to keep that thing in orbit. Yeah, it's not going to it's not going to orbit, but basically oh, I think Bill wants to say something. Yeah, it's you would have people back here taking one of the measurements and it would do the other one five. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. Right. Gotcha. And, you know, that's just one of the things it could do. You know, since this is going so far out of the solar system, we could put plenty of other things on here. And we could do those uh, in the intermittent 30 years between when it actually uh, launches and reaches that uh, focal line. So, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be just a single thing. So yeah, at the moment, it's still a concept. And there are plenty of problems we have to solve before we can even consider launching something like this. But if it works, we could end up with an image like this, uh, with incredible resolution uh, of a planet orbiting another star. And of course, we'd probably want to go for one we think is Earth-like. And we might, in addition to be able, able to see what it looks like, we also could measure, uh, take spectroscopic measurements of its atmosphere that basically tell us what sort of gases are in it. And if we find uh, that there are certain gases that don't really occur naturally, that could be a sign that they're being produced by some form of organic life. But that's just all sort of a hypothetical could happen. We don't really know until we get out there and take these pictures. But uh, yeah, it's very exciting to see what we could possibly learn and uh, see about these planets orbiting other stars. Anyway, um, that is it for my presentation. I didn't want to take too long because uh, Bill's sort of our feature uh, presenter tonight, and he's going to talk to you after the break about the speed of light. But basically, this is the uh, this is a paper that uh, was written by a astrophysicist at uh, JPL. I believe actually two of them. Um, so if you want to read more about this, uh, it's called Diffraction of Electromagnetic Waves in the Gravitational Field of the Sun. So I guess snap a picture of this if you can read what's up here. Um, if you want to read about this later on, if you're interested in that. But uh, yeah, that is pretty much it for me. So um, I guess I'll hand it back over to Jeremy now, and uh, I'll let him do the rest of the talking. So. Thank you,